Today, finally, a team of 14 nuclear safety inspectors arrived at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. It took weeks to negotiate safe passage for the team, and their arrival is not a minute too soon. There have been several potentially catastrophic failures at the plant in recent weeks, which Ukrainian and Russian forces are blaming on each other. The inspectors have their work cut out for them to safeguard Europe's largest nuclear power plant that happens to be in the middle of a war zone. We have this report. Experts from the International Atomic Energy Agency being shown around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant by Russian energy officials. On Thursday, they made a first tour of the key areas they wanted to see. With Ukraine and Russia blaming each other for shelling near the facility, the agency's head said the physical integrity of the plant had been violated, and he emphasized that their mission is far from over. We are not going anywhere. The IEA is now there, is at the plant, and is not moving. It's going to stay there. We're going to have a continued uh, presence there uh, at the plant with uh, some of my experts. The head of the power company that runs the plant said they are working to restart the reactor and expressed hope that the U.N. mission could help. We believe it would be like uh, main purpose of this mission for us uh, just to demilitarize the territory of the Paruji nuclear power plant and surrounding area. If uh, this mission helps to do that, then it will be successful. In the short term, the IAEA plans to keep a group of experts at the plant for the next several days to continue their assessment of the damage already done to the facility, a dangerous, unprecedented mission in the midst of a war zone. Well, my first guest tonight has worked as a safety inspector at nuclear power plants around the world, including at Chernobyl and Fukushima. He's also been an advisor in science and technology to the U.S. State Department. Mr. Najmadeen Meshkadi is an engineering professor at the University of Southern California. He joins me tonight from California. Professor, it's good to have you on the program. I'd like for us to start by listening to what the head of the IAEA said today after he and his team had made their first walk through at the Zaporizhia plant in Ukraine. Take a listen. I worry, I worried, I worry, and I will continue to be worried about the plant until we have a situation which is more stable, which is more predictable. It is obvious that, that the plant uh, and the physical integrity of the plant has been violated several times by chance, by, by uh, deliberation. So he sounds, Professor, like he is worried, he has reason to be worried. When he says the physical integrity of the plant has been um, violated, uh, how serious is that? What do you hear in those words? Uh, thank you for having me. First of all, I would like really to salute and commend Director General Mariano, Rafael Mariano Grossi and IAEA team for taking this, doing this mission at personal risk to their safety. They are heroes. I think what the uh, director general said is about uh, reading between the lines. He talked about the physical infrastructure, some of them, because they had, if you remember, loss of uh, offside power uh, for, for a few hours uh, last week. And uh, that plant has been under shelling. What I didn't hear from him in this clip that you broadcast said is the state of the mind of the operators and the safety culture and human performance due to duress, stress, and they're basically working at the gun point. And I am extremely worried, as Director General said, about the safety of these plants. Well, Professor, based on what we do know about the situation inside the plant, I mean, we've been told that you have Ukrainian workers who are carrying out their jobs at gunpoint by Russian forces. So when you hear that, how concerned are you that we could have an accident at this nuclear power plant, an accident that would happen by human error? That's a very good question. That's precisely my worry. Because if you look at the three major nuclear power plant accidents in our history, 
Three Mile Island in the United States, 1979, Chernobyl in former Soviet Union, Ukraine, 1986, and Fukushima, 2011 in Japan, both Daiichi and Dain. Two out of the three of these nuclear accidents that caused some major uh, disruption, they were caused by internal factors, not external factors. Mm -hmm. By internal factors, I mean human performance, safety culture related issues and human error. And this condition that these operators they have been subject to that since March 2nd of the Russian invasion is very dire. And that increases the human error probability by many folds, fatigue, stress, and then uncertainty. Plus that all the nine traits of healthy safety cultures unfortunately have been violated. Mm -hmm. Like the questioning attitude, environment for uh, respectful work environment. All of these have been violated by this in invasion. And it, if I hear you correctly, Professor, it, it is true. We've had two nuclear disasters in the world, the results of, of human error. And then at Fukushima, what we saw was an earthquake and then a tsunami, a natural disaster causing then a, a nuclear disaster. W with the Ukraine situation, Zaporizhia, we could have a situation where the workers make a mistake, but for the first time in history, we all have also have the situation that missiles or shelling outside could penetrate the, the walls of a reactor, for example, and cause a meltdown. This is a first, isn't it? There's not a guidebook for what inspectors are supposed to do, is there? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. This is the added value. We have this external risk because of uh, shelling. The shelling, the, the containment dome of the six reactors may uh, protect them against uh, the internal reactors sitting in the containment dome. They may be protected by the containment dome. But we have huge six spent fuel pools that they require constant circulation and they are not protected by containment dome. And then on the other side, the people, I, I always consider human operators of nuclear plant as the first and last, yellow of the last layer of defense of humanity. These people are subject to tremendous stress, very awful working condition and their families in the city of uh, Ergohobar, they are under tremendous stress and I really don't know the state of the mind of these people and I hope Director General Grossi and his team, they can get to that. P Professor, before we run out of time, you know, these inspectors, they have the way that their own lives are on the line right now, plus the lives of millions of other people are at stake right now. I mean, what would be your message to them? I ask, I wish them God's speed, due diligence in their work, I'm sure that they do. However, we may be asking too much from International Atomic Energy Agency, which its core is a technical organization. The report that they will be issuing yeah. is gonna be technical, but it will be many layers of political uh, things attached to that. I wish them God's speed, I'm sure they do a due diligence, but on the other hand, I think what we need is a little bit above and beyond International Atomic Energy Agency, okay. which is in the domain of UN Security Council. Professor Najmadeen Mishkani, we appreciate your time and your valuable insights tonight. Thank you. All right, we want to pull in now Vadim Chumak. He is head of the laboratory at Ukraine's National Research Center for Radiation Medicine, it's good to have you with us. Tell me, what should these inspectors be doing right now? What, what's the first duty for these inspectors? Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm not familiar with their particular plan, but I uh, can estimate uh, the possible actions of them. So first of all, they need to inspect the technical condition of the nuclear power plant in general, and most important, uh, technical condition of uh, the radioactive materials there. Uh, I mean uh, fuel assemblies, both spent fuel and uh, fresh fuel, uh, because they are, uh, pose quite some, uh, some danger, or I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very important that also they uh, relieve uh, some psychological pressure on the personnel of the nuclear power plant, because they're working for 
almost six months under uh, gunpoint from Russian forces, mm -hmm. uh, which is also not uh, in favor of uh, security. Well, Mr. Chumaki, you know, you bring up a good point. Um, the, the employees of the plant have been under tremendous pressure. These inspectors, they're also under pressure now, right? Because they perhaps are the only thing that stands between millions and millions of lives and a radioactive meltdown. Exactly. They're brave people. I really appreciate their, their courage and uh, their uh, motivation to go there because i know from the reports that it was not easy way today to get to the nuclear power plant indeed we know that um iodine tablets have been distributed across uh, that part of ukraine what is your biggest concern right now i mean what what would be the most acute danger in your opinion uh, actually, uh, this uh, 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 potassium iodine uh, uh, pellets, uh, pills, are uh, uh, good for extreme scenario, uh, which is uh, could be much like uh, Fukushima scenario, when uh, uh, electric supply for the pumps which are cooling the reactors stops, uh, the core starts uh, to melt down, then some hydrogen or uh, chemical explosion and then released to the atmosphere. And uh, since uh, at least two reactors are still operating, uh, they contain a lot of uh, various radionuclides, including iodine. Mm -hmm. And iodine has a peculiarity that uh, it is very uh, biologically accessible and very mobile. So it, uh, once it is released, it can e very easily get to the organism of, a, of, a, of people. And then there, it is, uh, has a property of accumulation in uh, thyroid gland, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, creates, uh, might create high doses. And uh, these uh, iodine pills, they uh, block uh, thyroid and prevent from this uh, intake and accumulation. Mr. Chuck, but this is a really worst case scenario. It's non, I don't worst. believe it's very likely. Well, we certainly hope it, um, that the worst case scenario will not become true. But in the event of a radiation leak, even if we were to have a meltdown, in your opinion, is the medical infrastructure already in place around Zaporizhia, but around that entire part of Ukraine to deal with mass exposure to radiation? Uh, it's a very good question. So actually, uh, we are considering such scenario uh, for quite a while. And uh, for instance, you mentioned these uh, uh, pills, they are already distributed and they are, will be available once they are needed. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, you know, uh, the distribution of radioactive materials depends on, on wind and on atmospheric conditions. And if wind blows to uh, eastern direction, to the territories which are occupied by invaders, uh, Ukraine doesn't have control, it cannot help mm -hmm. uh, population. So that's the main problem. Vadim Chumak, head of the laboratory at Ukraine's National Research Center for Radiation Medicine. Mr. Chumak, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you.